Are you somebody that struggles a little bit with trimming your aquarium plants? Well, today I got the perfect video for you. My name is Logan and I'd like to welcome you back to Logan Rano Aquascaping. Right over here is my UNS 45U and this is a proper nature aquarium. I've had it since September of 2023 and it's evolved a lot. And I'm liking the way it looks, but it's definitely overdue for a bit of a trim. In a couple weeks, I wanna film all the tanks in my studio and do a proper studio tour. And in order to do that, we gotta get this tank looking good. So today I'm gonna take you through a live demo of how I trim all the different plants and kind of get them looking really good. So we'll cover how to trim a carpet, how to trim stem plants, how to trim rosette plants, and pretty much all the techniques and tools I use. So without further ado, let's get right started with that trimming. All right, so my general approach to trimming a planted aquarium with a variety of plants is to start with the least messy, disruptive plants and then work our way up to the most disruptive messy processes. So usually trimming a carpet, especially hair grass, is a pretty messy process. Whereas trimming something like storage in repens is gonna be a little simpler. So we're gonna start with the simple things. And the first thing I'm gonna do is grab my curved scissors and we're gonna start with this plant right here. This is Pagostomum helferi, and it's really beautiful. It reminds me a lot of a fern that you'd see in the Pacific Northwest. And it grows really, really rapidly in this tank. But first thing I wanna do is kinda of take it down a little bit because what it's doing is it's obstructing the view of the stones and it's causing them to lose their impact. So what I wanna do is kinda of get in there with my curved scissors and I want to really just start taking things down. And while this is a rosette plant, it sort of grows like a stem almost. You get these tall stems that then kind of like splay out. So I'm almost just using my eye for this process. And you know, you can be pretty brutal. I'm just kind of going through and anything that is visually impeding my view to the back, I'm just gonna hack down. Now when I can, I'm aiming for the stem itself. But you know, if you hack a leaf in half, just try and remove the rest of the leaf because if you do damage a leaf, it's not gonna come back. And there's lots of little shrimp and stuff in here. So I'm just making sure to dodge them. But in my eight years of keeping planted aquariums, I've never lost a shrimp to scissors. They're just too fast. So we're gonna kind of work our way down and restore our view of the stones. And the reason I like to do this a few weeks before, you know, I'm filming a, a very like B-roll heavy video is, you know, often when you make big changes like this, your plants need a few weeks to bounce back. So we're doing this about a couple weeks ahead of when I want the tank to look prime again. And you know, the secret is you really gotta kind of get in all sorts of different angles and twist your arm and walk around. So a little bit tricky while filming, but I'm gonna do my best. So I'm actually gonna stand up for this next part and get a little bit more leverage. And we're gonna take these guys down over here. And like I said, you wanna start with really the least messy processes. And this is a plant that's fairly easy to just like scoop up when you're done trimming it. Whereas something like hair grass, it's so fine and hairy, hence the name, that, you know, it's really gonna take you a good 15, 20 minutes to get all those trimmings out. So I like to kind of start with the easy stuff, almost as if, you know, you were cleaning your house, right? You might dust first before you mop. So you can already see, this is making a big difference. And you know, the first time you trim, you might say to yourself, man, it took me so long to grow these plants. Like, why would I cut them in half? That's so scary. But the thing you gotta know is that plants are really resilient. So you can be fairly brutal if they're healthy. If your tank is brand new, you know, you don't wanna trim it down right away. You wanna give those plants a few weeks to establish. But once they're established and healthy, they'll actually come back a lot healthier with regular trimming. It promotes something called lateral growth, uh, which is really the opposite of stemmy, leggy growth. And by lateral, we mean to the side. So bushy and compact and, and horizontal rather than that, you know, starved for light look where you have really long stems. So this is making a pretty nice difference so far. You can see not only do we have a more optimal view of the stones, but we also have a more optimal view 
the Rotala Wallachii in the back. So it's making good progress. All right, let's see. And we're gonna go through and at this point, just kind of trim off any leaves that kind of look odd, kind of stand out like a little bit of a sore thumb. Very nice. And you can see these tall leaves over here. They're just obstructing the stone, so I'm gonna be extra brutal with that plant right there. Okay, and now we've got the bulk of our work done. So let's work our way a little bit more towards the back because you can see some of this Pagasimum Helferi is almost like intertwining with the Rotala. And I don't really like that. I like for those plantlets to be kind of distinct groupings. So I'm gonna go through and kind of brutally tease those plants out. I'm gonna need a chiropractor by the time this video is over. You know, one of the challenges with filming is it just makes any sort of aquarium task 10 times harder than it needs to be because you don't want to block the camera and you know, you still want to get a good shot and engage. So forgive me for maybe taking a little bit longer, but you know, I really like these types of tutorials. I remember when I first got into aquascaping and you know, to this day, those tutorials where you can just kind of watch somebody and pick up on little techniques are super valuable. And that's the beauty of YouTube, baby. You can just share your knowledge and do it in a way that feels really conversational. So that's what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to make more long form content like this. So let me know what you guys think of it because I like to make it. It's a lot of work, but I really like making these. Cool, so that's a pretty good job on the Pagostimum Hell Fairy. So next up, we're gonna tackle this plant over here. And this is a beautiful plant called Blixa japonica. And it's actually the newest plant in this tank. So you'll notice that some of the leaves are maybe a little bit rotted. And that's because there's a little bit of an adjustment period. Whenever you add a new plant to your tank, that plant has to adjust to those water conditions. And Blixa is one of the few plants that we keep in this hobby that is truly aquatic. So most of the plants we keep are bog plants, meaning they grow partially immersed whereas Blixa fully underwater. So when I purchased it, it came from a tank with set conditions, set hardness, and now it's adjusting to mine, but you can see the leaves are turning red because of the really good lighting. And I've been dosing low nitrate lean fertilization, so that further promotes that. Got an entire video on that if you're interested. All right, let's tackle the Blixa. Same kind of approach with the Blixa. I'm looking for leaves that are kind of odd, that kind of stand out and I'm just removing them. So like, I don't like that this is just sticking out way higher than everything else. So I'm just gonna snip it off. Actually gonna swap over to the other side. And the shrimp love these leaves. They love just grazing on them. And the cool thing is, you know, as you take leaves down, you kind of uncover other sections of the tank that have been hidden. And you might even rediscover composition that was lost. So it's important to do this from time to time. Now, a lot of people, they just love the overgrown jungle look and I totally dig it too. But you know, for me, I'm a hardscape almost before anything guy. So anytime I see I'm losing the impact of my composition, I want to restore that. But if you're somebody who's super low maintenance with their tanks and just wants to let them be, then, you know, you can just let nature take its course and let things take over. But, you know, most plants will really benefit from regular trimming, so don't be afraid to do it. And you can see I uncovered a little bit more of the Pagostimum by trimming down the Blixa. So just hacking that down. Beautiful. And again, you know, with the Blixa, this is gonna stimulate bushier growth, which is really the look I want. You know, I don't want it to get too tall. I don't want it to steal the impact of the stones. After all, this is just a UNS 45U. It's only 10 gallons. So we wanna maintain a sense of scale and super tall, you know, plants can ruin that. Okay, working my way over to the other side. And we got these Blixas over here. So, you know, same kind of technique. I'm just gonna take out what I can. Okay, we're gonna start at the back. 
And for the Blixa in the back, I'm okay with it being taller. You know, one of the cool things about building a sense of scale in your tank is that you can use this concept called forced perspective. So part of that is sloping things towards the back to create an enhanced sense of depth, which is essentially tricking your eye into thinking things are more distant and larger than they actually are. The other trick is a pretty simple one that I'm sure you're familiar with, and that's to use short plants up front and then taller plants in the back. So I'm okay with this Blixa being a little bit taller in the back, but we wanna keep it under control and we wanna promote a bushier look. So trimming it is highly conducive towards both of those goals. Awesome. That's the one in the back tackled. Now let's tackle the one in the front. All right, so I think this one is probably the most egregious violator of, you know, ugly leaves. And, you know, sometimes you'll have plants that are really tricky to get to. So if you can time your big trimmings like this with your lily pipe maintenance, that'll give you a little bit more uh, room to move your arms, but not gonna work for me. I just did my lily pipe maintenance yesterday, so these bad boys are not coming out, but that's okay. And that's why, like, you know, I really recommend investing in a good pair of aquascaping pincettes and then a nice long pair of wave scissors like this. These are the UNS wave scissors. I love them. And they're fantastic for getting in the tight little spaces, which, you know, I'm doing a lot right now, so. You can also see this plant over here is not fully rooted. It's got roots coming down from it, but, you know, Blix is a very buoyant plant, so it'll float up easy. So I'm gonna take my pin sets and I'm gonna just make sure it's a little bit more anchored. Cause if there's one thing I can't stand is waking up to floating plants. So we'll just get that guy in there. And my technique is always to just pin it down with the pin sets and then use my other hand to secure it. All right, brilliant. We got her in there. Cool, already making progress. Now, when you're doing this, always keep a dry rag nearby because, you know, it's usually a messy process. I also recommend draining the tank water down a little bit because inevitably you're gonna displace water with the weight of your hands, etc. So you don't wanna be spilling that all over the place. But, you know, for the purposes of the video, I wanted to keep it a little bit higher just so, you know, the tank looks good. All right, so let's take inventory. We've gotten through our Pagostomum Helferi. We've gotten through the majority of our Blixa. Now let's tackle the S for Pens. One of my favorite plants, one of the easiest plants. And again, I put this plant in fairly new, so I wanna just trim it down a little bit, kind of give a little bit more space up front. You know, I feel things are a little crowded there, so we're gonna do a little trimming. And you know what? I think I'll switch up the tool to demonstrate something different. Here's another tool that you know, this isn't number one in my arsenal, but let's say I got to pick three tools. This might be up there. So these are the spring scissors and they're really cool because they're incredibly ergonomic and you get the leverage of being able to push in. You know, with your scissors, you gotta open up and then close. And with these, you just press and it trims. So these are gonna be perfect for the Estra pens. Okay, same thing with the S for pens. We don't wanna hack it down, but we wanna take out any growth that is just a little bit larger than what I'd like. So I don't want these to get too tall, right? Because they're in the front of the tank. So I'm just kinda of taking out the taller portions of it, as well as leaves that are entering little sections that I don't want them to. And that's one of the really cool things about this hobby is you plant your tank and then you can kind of like train your plants to grow in patterns that you find very favorable. You know, it's almost like bonsai in that sense. So, Estra Pens is one that is really cool to do that with because it really responds well to trimmings and it's a pretty fast grower. So, you know, if you hack it back, it'll come back pretty quickly. So 
a lot of opportunities to train its growth and, you know, just get it growing and occupying space that looks really good for your tank. All right, switching over to the other side. Pardon my camera cross. So this side doesn't look too bad. We're just gonna pull the occasional leaf that I don't love. What I mostly dislike is the crowding up here. So I'm gonna create a little recession basically by removing plants that have sort of gotten to that point where they're touching the glass. You know, you really don't want things like banging up against the glass because it just ruins that, you know, sense of infinity and, and openness that a tank should have. So when you got things that feel really cramped, you know, your imagination can't can't wander as much as beautiful aquascape invites it to. So just clearing the odd leaf. Esther Pens is a really special one for me. It's one of the first plants that, you know, I was really able to experiment with a lot. I feel like almost every shop carries it. So it's readily available. And again, it's almost like foolproof. So when you're a beginner, it's a good one to get. Um, you know, it absolutely thrives with CO2. You can carpet a tank with it if you wanted. But I think it'll probably do okay without it. We're just taking out little sections here and there. Cool. And you know, the thing is with these trimmings, things will look a little bit ugly for a week or two, but once they fill back in, they'll be healthier and they'll begin to fit into that growth pattern that you're going for. So that's the idea. Okay, so we tackled a lot of things so far, but as we uncover more sections of plants that were previously inaccessible due to overgrowth, you're gonna to wanna to work a little bit backwards. So I'm noticing at this point that some of the pagostimum is still a little unsightly, particularly this section, now that I've thinned out some of the blixa. So I'm gonna go back over that section and uh, hack it down a little bit more. All right, so this leaf in particular is just giant. And you know, with the take of this size, it's particularly important for me to keep things small in texture because UNS 45U, you know, 45 centimeters, about nine gallons and change. As soon as you get really big textures, you just totally kill your scale. So these stones I'm using, the wolf stone, which I got from Boost Plant, you know, really detailed, fine texture. So if I have a giant leaf in front of it, it competes you know, for your attention while simultaneously killing the scale. So I really aim to keep my plants tight in this tank. Whereas if this was like a 120 or something, you could let things grow a lot larger. But that's the cool thing about these aquarium plants is, you know, some, some plants just aren't gonna work in, you know, a nano tank. If you care about, you know, design and some of the aquascaping rules, but a lot of plants could be trimmed to stay relatively compact. You know, like if I had a tall tank, I could let this Rotala grow really high, but I'm not going to because, you know, this is only a UNS 45U. So we're going a little bit more freestyle right now, as you can see. Not everything has to be perfectly organized in the world of trimming. I often get a little bit of an organized chaotic workflow when I'm doing this. I'll put YouTube on and just kind of go crazy and get in my flow state. I really dig trimming, even though it can be messy. It's one of those things where it just renews my interest in a tank because I get excited to see how things are gonna grow back. All right, so really wanna uncover more of this rock in the back. So I'm almost working in like layers. Like if you ever get a haircut, you know, a men's haircut and, and some women's cuts too. So he's about working in layers to create, you know, something that looks really good. And that's what I often do with hardscaping and with planting is you kind of work in layers and build off of the past. So now I'm just gonna be a little bit brutal, take more of this down, uncover more of this foreground rock. Cool. 
Awesome. So next thing I'm going to do is just pull up some of these trimmings. And when we resume, we will move on to the stem plants. All right, my friends. So as you can see, we've done a lot of pretty good trimming so far. We're starting to recover the composition a little bit. The rocks are a lot more visible. The plants are a little bit more distinct and I've removed all the trimmings. So next step is to tackle the stems and working with stems can be pretty fun because again, you can really shape stems in the hills and train really tight growth. So these stems, while the color is really cool, they're looking a little bit leggy and kind of stringy and not so nice for what I'm going for. So the goal is to ultimately get these looking really bushy and compact and we're not there yet. I've only trimmed and replanted a single time and and you have to do it a lot to get stem plants to look that really cool, you know, Amano style. So we're gonna do that a little bit today and I'm gonna teach you a technique called topping that I highly recommend when working with stem plants. Now, in order to do the topping technique, you know, kind of cleanly and not make a big mess, I'm gonna be very careful with how I trim. So we're gonna go kind of one stem at a time and I'm gonna take out really the tall ones that just kind of stand out and are shading the lower ones. And you can see I've accidentally cut a few already, so that's no problem. And you know, when I trim stem plants, especially when working with the topping technique, I wanna to get as close to the base as possible. And anytime you trim a stem plant, like a rotala, where you cut, it's gonna form two new stems. A lot of us call that the hydra effect. So if you trim up really high, you're gonna get this weird looking you know, hydra of stem that's gonna look really unnatural. So it's important to trim low towards the base of the plant so that your eye doesn't really see that. So I'm doing that with my wave scissors, which lets me get nice and low. So we won't trim every plant. Like these ones are a decent height, but anything that kind of stands out, like you see this one is, you know, about an inch taller than its compatriots. We're gonna take it down pretty low. Yes, I realize that referring to a stem plant as having compatriots is possibly a little weird. But here we are in one of the most niche hobbies there are, so. All right, we're getting there. This guy really stands out. Working my way towards the back. Yeah, any kind of growth that just really stands out to me. You can see this one has got to go. So we'll just kind of tease him up. And then, you know, I like to have my growth up front a little bit shorter for that sense of scale. Okay, let's work with that. And then once we replant those and kind of top them, we can do some finer trimming. So the topping technique, step one, trim your plants as low as you can at their base. Step two, using your aquascaping pincettes, you're gonna take those stems and literally just kind of dig them in to the cluster. So you can put them directly in the soil, but it's actually not necessary. And usually getting them back in the soil with a topping technique is quite difficult. You often do this when the tank is more mature and you're doing a trimming of established plants. So you're literally topping them into the cluster. Let me show you how it's done. Okay, so we're gonna take a nice and tall guy right here. And then like my technique for grabbing these is to kind of run your pin sets parallel so that you have really good force. And then you literally just get it in there, kind of tuck them in and voila, that's how topping works. So I'm gonna do that kind of stem by stem, which can be a little bit tedious. But again, for me, the trimming process is often very zen-like. So while I can't necessarily get into my flow state on camera, if I was doing this on a Saturday morning, I'd have some coffee first, get a little hyped up. And usually what I do is I like to catch up on YouTube videos that I can like passively listen to in the back. So even though I make aquascaping content, I still like to consume it as well. So I catch up on all the channels that I follow get inspiration for aquariums, get inspiration for videos, get inspiration for editing. But I also consume a lot of YouTube content that isn't aquarium related. 
What channels, you ask? Well, one of my favorite channels is Rick Beato. Uh, if you're a music person, you might know him. Uh, Beato is the man. He's a boomer who is just like an absolutely music savant, um, you know, just real theory nerd and an amazing guitarist and at really everything, knows a lot about production. So I like that channel. Uh, while I'm a beginner musician, I feel like consuming content like that you know, I kind of just like osmos 1% of what he's saying. And that's kind of how I can be for uh, aquarium content too. You know, I, I watch guys that are way more advanced and more talented than me. And if I could just pick up, you know, one to 3% of what they're putting out. And with aquascaping, you know, while I'm not the best in the world, I'm, I'm not a beginner anymore. I pick up, you know, everything they're putting down. But if I can implement just a little bit of it, become just a little bit better every month, for me, I'm quite content with that. But that's just my personal goal. You don't have to ever get better, it's up to you. If the hobby brings you joy and you don't wanna treat it like a skill, there's no obligation to. So with my videos, you know, I try and give you guys techniques and sort of share my knowledge and approach. But even if you're not trying to level up, you might get some information and techniques that just make it a little bit easier for you. And I think whenever the hobby is easier, it can be more enjoyable. Okay, so we've done most of our topping off. We got a few stray stems over here. But you can see things are still kind of funky, like almost looks like Hey Arnold with the, uh, <laughs> the stems coming off the side, if you know what I mean. Only 90s kids will get that reference. No, I'm just kidding. I'm sure lots of people watch Tay Arnold. Um, but if you're a 90s kid, it's probably extra special to you. Now we're gonna go through somewhat brutally and just kind of shape things. So with the topping technique, we've created some density, but I'm finding that the plants are just not in the shape I like. Really, I want a hill. I want a hill that kind of apexes in the middle in that little visual section in the middle of the tank. So what I'm doing is I'm now trimming the plants to kind of fit that hill idea. And same thing here, while I can't completely trim at the base for everything, I will have nothing. You can replant these little sections, but a lot of what I just cut on the sides aren't gonna be visible to the eye. So I don't have to stress as much about, you know, topping there. Really the topping technique, I mean, not only does it give you extra density for your stems, but it's like a visual aesthetics thing. Cause you can see, you know, where I cut, it's not the most aesthetically pleasing. So by topping it, you know, if you had a gallery like Green Aqua does in Hungary, you always want your tanks looking showroom ready. So by topping, you know, your plants look super healthy. Nobody wants to look at, you know, a uh, decapitated plant. So we'll do some more topping with these guys to kind of fill in our sections, add to the density, etc. And this is a technique that I'm ashamed to say um, I didn't know about for a few years into my hobby. Um, I've always had an admiration for stems. I mean, I just think they're the coolest and the things you can do with stem plants is just next level. But, you know, I would just kind of trim things down willy nilly. And then I found this video. One of my favorite videos ever is a video of Victor Lantos from the Green Aqua team. If you're not familiar, he's one of the founding members. And it's one of their older videos, you know, um, before they really kind of like established their insane production value. Not, not that it's a low production value video, but you know, the editing's a little janky, the, the audio mixing's a little bit janky, but it's just Victor. And you know, Victor is such a cool, calming dude. I got to meet him in real life a few years back. Um, but it's just him tr trimming a tank like this and uh, he, he shows the topping technique in that video. I think a lot of these techniques just came from forums. You know, it's not that long ago that this hobby lived on forums and people would just try stuff and then share it on forums and then people would repeat it and be like, oh yeah, dude, that totally works. So 
Um, I know Victor is a big proponent of this, but I'm sure a lot of the old school guys know about the topping technique. You know, now it's ubiquitous. Everybody kind of like knows about these cool little tips and tricks, which is an interesting thought experiment. You gotta wonder like, okay, this hobby has gone from, you know, even when I got into it eight years ago, like it was still really difficult to find people who were serious in your local area and have shop, you know, find a shop in your area that had like healthy plants or more than a single tissue culture cup of something that wasn't dead. And now I feel like people are really catching on and, you know, social media and YouTube probably has a lot to do with that. So I'm curious, like, are we going to look back on these times as almost a dark age where people are like, yeah, that was before we knew about, you know, XYZ technique or who knows, man, but it's cool. I'm totally along for the ride. I'm loving it. Awesome. So those are going to look small for a little bit, but in a couple weeks, they'll be a lot taller and they'll be much more in line with what I'm trying to establish with that hill in the back. Okay, so we've done the bulk of our work here. We started with the Pagostimum and kind of worked our way over to the Blixa and then hacked down some storage and repens and then the stems. Final part is the carpet. Trimming a carpet can be really fun and relaxing. I have an entire video teaching you how to do that with my Glosso carpet. But hair grass is a royal pain in the butt just because it's so messy and fine. But it's still pretty fun to trim, so let me show you how we're gonna do that. Favorite tool, as usual, wave scissors, and these are just absolutely made for trimming a carpet because of the leverage you get, right? If these were straight, you know, you'd have to get in a weird kind of like angle to get your carpet. So because of the wave, you can kind of just angle down a little bit and then work your way onto the carpet. So hair grass, just like any other carpet, no rhyme or reason to trimming it. You just want to hack it down as close to the base as possible. Make sure you're not uprooting anything. So let's start kind of over here and work our way to the right. All right, trimming the hair grass. So this plant has struggled a little bit in here for some reason. I mean, this tank has gone a lot of, it's gone through a lot of changes, so that could be why, but particularly in the middle, it's a little bit barren. So I've replanted sections a couple times to stimulate new growth. But I'm hoping that this trimming also helps us fill in a little bit. But my guess as to why the hair grass hasn't absolutely thrived is because of CO2 distribution. So you may notice that this section right here looks so much healthier than the middle and the right side. And that's because that's where the CO2 diffuser normally sits. And 90% and of the time, CO2 is going to be the answer to why are my plants, you know, X, Y, Z? Why do I have algae? CO2 is almost always the thing you want to address for first. Lighting's a big one too, but you know, in my case, I, I've always got great lights, so I, I know the quality of my light is never an issue. If I had algae, you know, I'd want to adjust the intensity of the light, etc. But algae is not too bad in this tank. But the plant health is somewhat inconsistent. So first thing I want to address is CO2. Now I use a drop checker to check the amount of CO2. It was turned in lime green by the time the lights were on, so I knew I was good there. But because I saw that irregular pattern of growth, I formed the hypothesis that, all right, this is a distribution issue. So what I did was I switched to an inline CO2 system that works in line with my canister filters outflow. And generally speaking, inline CO2 systems get you much more homogeneous, even distribution throughout the tank. Whereas that in-tank diffuser, you know, while it gets the job 90% of the time, I just wasn't getting the results I needed in here. So that's what I'm gonna try. I just installed it yesterday. So I'm monitoring CO2 levels with the drop checker. Of course, the CO2 is off now because I'm trimming and doing this big maintenance session, but I'm hoping that all the growth in a few weeks will look like this on the left because this is what hair grass should look like is that dense, healthy look where, you know, you can't even see a centimeter of soil. You don't want it to be patchy. So, you know, sometimes with the smaller tanks, distribution and circulation can be a little bit of an issue. Now I know circulation is not the problem because I have a massive filter in the cabinet, I'm using the Owaza Biomaster 350, which, you know, you could put that on like a 60 gallon tank. 
So I know water distribution and circulation isn't a problem, but you know, sometimes depending on how things are laid out, getting the actual CO2 to make contact with the plant is hypothesized to be very important. And you know, that's probably just not the case in every square inch of this tank. So hoping that the inline CO2 addresses that and in a few weeks we have some really healthy looking hair grass. But you know, for now it doesn't look bad, but I, I've just got really high standards where carpets are concerned. And if for some reason the trimming and the uh, inline CO2 doesn't work, I'll just probably replace the front with something like a Monte Carlo or a Glosso or something. But, you know, this is kind of my experiment tank. I like to try things and when things fail, I give this tank a little bit more leeway for perseverance because, yeah, I just always like having one tank at least that I can try stuff with and maybe be a little bit more patient. And that's, you know, multiple tank syndrome can become chaotic and, and really cluttered very quickly. But, you know, if you're somebody like me who still puts a lot of work into every single tank they have and cares about the way they look, um, it can be really beneficial because you can kind of give some tanks a little bit more leeway. If you have a tank or two that is just absolutely thriving and is stable, you know, you can have that problem child like this one is for me that you can just treat as your little experimental group. And that's how we learn, right? Is, you know, we fail and I use failure in a positive way. Um, with aquascaping failure is just figuring out, you know, one permutation or one method that doesn't give you the best results. So, you know, try something new next time. And that's what this tank is for me. You know, it started off kind of crappy. I had really bad diatom issues. So I sort of like did a soft rescape and then, you know, added more plants. And now I quite enjoy it. So I'm actually gonna leave the back a little bit higher because again, scale and all that, but I really just wanted to take a little bit off of the front because like I said, recently I replanted some sections and I wanna give them the opportunity to come back nice and dense because I do not like that I can see the soil up front. That really bugs me. So fingers crossed, but there you have it guys. That is the gist of it. I know this was, you know, maybe not filmed the best way possible because it's really difficult to, you know, trim a small tank like this and get the best angles, etc. But I hope you learned something. We went over a lot of different techniques, but if there's something I missed that you would have been doing if this was your tank, go ahead and let me know down below in the comments. And for now, enjoy some B-roll of the tank a couple weeks later. Here it is with a little bit of new growth. But as the weeks go on, the plants will look better and better and even more healthy. So thank you so much for sticking around for this long one. I hope you learned something. And it's really important to me, if you like this longer content, which I don't usually do, let me know down below in the comments. If it's something that I find performs well, I'd love to do more stuff like this. So I'd love to hear from you. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you guys and gals next time.